welcome all to this um, uh, public meeting for, of the Trust. Uh, welcome to Lisa, who has joined us as an observer, so, and, uh, from the public at all. Trading Registrar, understanding the Trust, is that right, Lisa? You're very welcome. Um, let's go straight in. We've got a couple of apologies. Alan Craft sent a little message from the West Indies. <laughs> Lots is high. <laughs> and Ruth, who I think is in not quite such exciting circumstances, go over the way. Apologies for that. And, um, and David Elliott. And David Elliott as well, that's right. Yeah. Um, have, you might have just spotted that this meeting is following immediately on FIP, which is why that we're starting this one five minutes early. This is a legacy. Um, there used to be some other guy working here sitting in this chair, and he used to have a bit of a job in London. So uh, the the idea was to ad adapt the the board to follow fit to meet his diary convenience. Well, we don't have to do that. Anymore. So <laughs> come, come March, we're going to be changing. We'll, we'll go back to fit, and then a few days later. Uh, so apologies for the somewhat crammed day uh, uh, Other than that. Um, I've got nothing. Nobody's about to bring a surprise and, and bring a big any other business, are they? No, they're not. So we're happy with the agenda as is. Um, let's go straight in then. First of all, the um, minutes of the 30th November for accuracy and correctness. All okay? Yeah. Should we just go on to the action log? Um, it's marked as connectivity problems on the ANIC infirmary site complete. However, Dave Elliott isn't here, and I'm not quite sure if it is complete. Um, so just I'm asking for that list to come back to the next meeting. My understanding is the internet connectivity is still not absolute. Uh, when I was last at ANIC, I heard it, and Marion says she was there on Friday, um, and there's still kind of intermittent connectivity. And issues. Oh yes, I can just add. Um, the first stage is complete, but there's still more work to be done, so it's still work in progress. Right? Okay, that's fine. And it's good to have checks on the progress of from issues that come up from the board walkabouts. And noting uh, in, in the minutes, um, we had really a really good discussion last time on the board walkabout. And although it wasn't listed as, as an action, um, there were several comments about signage, um, and I should have flagged this up earlier, but can look on, I know we're doing some work just to kind of looking at signage across the piece, across the sites. Um, uh, I've got Damon here, but what, Ross, are you, are you cited on this? To I am. Um, I know we, we've started to, 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 with a group of governors and volunteers sort of setting the task to look at various sites and, and see if we can find places that we're setting them to. And I know, I don't know the deal, but I know Jason is working on a plan to Okay. Uh, so we'll make, we'll hear more in, in due course on that. Um, apart from that, none of the other actions are due, so I've got nothing coming up from the action log. Then we're good to go on. My introduction uh, is only to say uh, quite relatively smooth January. I mean, problems of ED and, and performance figures there, but given that we've had a change of chief executive, it's been pretty smooth, hasn't it? And it certainly felt smooth from where I've been sitting. Uh, so commending Bijou for uh, the actions in managing to make this a, a kind of a trauma-free process so far. So, and that's the introduction to 1.5. Bijou, your dashboard. Yeah. So you'll see the dashboard um, here. And I think probably, as the chairman's just said, um, December, given that we had strikes during this period of time, um, as well as the usual winter pressures that we start to see, was was really well managed by the teams and the enactment of the winter plan that's come to trust board previously again was a smooth transition obviously and we'll hear later on there's a review later on i think of the winter update <coughs> um, on the agenda but january does feel a bit tricky as you would expect and that we see that across the region and i think um in terms of our national position on a number of these metrics in particular around operational performance, whilst it's not where we want to be, we still uh, place ourselves in a very good position. And obviously you can see on the dashboard there, both from a finance point of view, 
um, uh, operational performance point of view and uh, workforce. So despite our sickness absence being slightly higher than we would want it to be, I know the people in the OD committee are deliberately working very focused in a very focused way to reduce that down. Our position is very much in line with where we would expect it to be. I think the other thing just to probably comment on in terms of taking on the new role, um, we have across the organisation reset where our focus needs to be for the year ahead, so particularly around doing the fundamentals right. So how do we make sure we are on top of our game, both in terms of performance, finance, um, our safety and quality measures and remembering our patient and staff experience, which is absolutely key and at the core of everything that we're about as an organisation. And I think having that focus, that refocus internally, we've always been good at it, but having that refocus is really important, particularly in this transition period. And I think as part of that, we then start to work on all the additional things that delivering on those allows us to do. Uh, and one of those which we will bring back to a future uh, board, it's come to board development a couple of times already as well, is starting to deliver on key components of our clinical strategy. So we've had a lot of talking and thinking and piloting the previous year. As we move into 24, there's elements that we now need to start to deliver on where we start to see a shift in what some of these performance metrics might show in the future. Very good. Any questions or comments to Beijing? Uh, as part of the interim process, we're, we're joined by new colleagues at the, uh, on the table here. Do you want to just say anything about the interim? Yeah, so just before, we all intend as part of our discussions with Remco and others to go out to a more substantive recruitment process um, from April onwards. In the interim, we've got a number of deputies that I had in my old role that are uh, working into slightly enhanced roles uh, to deliver uh, some of the portfolio that I had. So today we've got Paul McNeely and Mark Sweatherly from um, Medicine and Emergency Care Viewpoint, Beth Godwin from Clinical Support and Child Health, and Chris Jenkins from uh, Performance and Governance. Yeah, so welcome to you four, and a little reminder, this is a unitary board. In other words, don't just come here thinking you're here to defend your area of responsibility. You're here to contribute and challenge others as appropriate and just join in. So, uh, all your contributions will be welcome. Well, all your good contributions. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing more, any more comments or questions to be sure. Great, let's move on. Joe, this is your patch. Um, this will be start with the patient and staff story. It's a really interesting one to begin with. Thank you, Jay. So apologies for my voice um, ahead of my feedback. Um, so this um, this this board the story for board staff and patient story for board is a little bit different to what we would normally yeah. do. So you'll see that it's from a range of people, and I think it's for two reasons that we include a number of people in both the staff story and the patient story. Um, from the staff perspective, it's to underline the real collaborative approach and the real partnership working that has got this wonderful piece of work, this project off the ground. Um, from a patient perspective, I think in the middle it relates to the patient group. So a lot of our patients on Ward 6 and NSEC, where this story is from, have limited capacity in respect of um, a diagnosis of dementia or like Alzheimer's. So it makes it quite difficult in terms of producing a full single patient story. So what we thought we'd do for this particular story is take a range of comments and testimonials from family members who actually are able to tell the story of the difference that this, this project on Ward 6 is making to their family members. Um, so as I said, the story itself comes from Ward 6 and the team there have been doing amazing work in terms of um, a, a, an activities project for patients and environmental change that's been done in partnership with the Bright Charity in Northumbria. So we've got um, a range of reflective experiences from the Ward Manager to the Ward Sister, a healthcare assistant who has a secondment in part to be an activity coordinator, a member of the Bright Charity. Um, the ward manager talks very much about the catalyst for the work. 
that actually through learning about the Act of Lord, another piece of work that we have happening in the Trust, she really wanted to something similar to be happening on her ward for her patients and to set the standards for activities and socialisation for patients within the emergency care hospital in Northumbria. The Lord Sister for me, she talks very much about the positive change that this work is having on the culture of the Lord and that if, makes, if everybody feels just feels a more positive and more, it's got real direction in terms of that socialisation, activities, um, engaging both patients and staff. Um, the HCA, one of the HCA, so she's just one of I think it's two or three HCAs that have a, a dual role in terms of their HCA role and an activity coordinator, talks very much about the impact on patients, the ability, <laughs> the ability to be able to socialise with others, um, get away from the bedside, go into a wonderful environment that's been created by the by charity in terms of a reminisce room, to be able to do activities, interact with each other. Um, and what that means to the families, as she describes one, one member of family as actually getting quite emotional when seeing their family member taking part in these activities that range from cake making to um, art, design, singing, which we know evidence-based shows uh, um, singing is actually really good for people with a diagnosis of um, dementia. So she talks very much about the impact that that has and also being able to socialise away from the bed bedside for families and patients in terms of visiting. And um, the member of staff from Bright Charity, she talks about the changes that the charity was able to fund um, not only the remedies room, but to be able to change one of the corridors with local scenes um, from around the region, which gives people a chance to be able to look, walk together and look at those scenes and stimulate conversation. And so much so, the success of this work from the perspective of Bright Charity that they've used it for a blueprint to be able to use that on other areas such as the Walton Unis. So I think all in all, from a staff experience, it's a really positive thing that's happened. It's great. Um, <laughs> as soon as you can, Jo, you've given us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of patients, I think the quotes and the testimonials speak for themselves. Um, I think the two family members particularly talk about because of um, a, di a diagnosis of dementia and a father who has a human difficulty and is deaf, they are very much subject to isolation because of their conditions and being able to come away and socialise with others in the rest, reminisce room. And there was one quote from a lady that, I don't know about all of you, but it touched my heart. And she said, it's nice to think of the hospital in this way. So she now associates the hospital with the pleasure that she was able to get by going into the activities room and being able to do those activities with other members of the ward, of the ward patients, people she may not necessarily have spend time with because they may have been in different bays in different rooms and have that ability to socialise. So I just thought it was an excellent piece of work to bring to the board and make aware of the work. And I think it's very much about what we talk about in North about staff seeing an opportunity and feeling able and wanting to just get on and make that difference for patients on their own team. That's great, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. I think I was just struck by um, the positivity of, of the um, example and I think people don't mind saying that care of the elderly is sometimes being in the past quite difficult to recruit and I just think this positivity shown to this example will be interesting to see the effect on recruitment and retention and also sickness um, rates as well. I think it was a lovely example. That's great. That's a really good thought actually, how we can use the learning from this in uh, recruitment and retention. Bijan? I think it is, a, it is a fantastic story and if anybody gets the opportunity when you're on your walkabouts in MSEC, it is worth going to. It's only a small one that they've made a maximum space and usage out of. And if you speak to both, you get the opportunity to speak to patients who happen to be in the room doing a particular activity and the staff. Everybody will say it's very positive. It takes away where we have people just watching people from a falls watch point of view, whereby what the ward will tell you now is that their falls have reduced or not all because their patients are busy and are active through the day and more restful and sleep at night as a consequence. It's very much something that's come from the staff. It wasn't anything that any of us have wandered around and suggested. So
think from an improvement story journey point of view as well, absolutely. It was something I think that we were worried about, that they would want to hold on to patients for too long as a consequence, but that hasn't played out either. And Claire's fantastic. I saw Claire on Friday and still absolutely wax lyrical about what fabulous um, service it is and the healthcare assistance on the board in particular. That's great. Lastly, it's a good comms story, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, a really good piece of work. And I, I just think I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the uh, charitable fund. So it's it's kind of part of this new approach where we're trying to be much more of a strategic partner for the organisation and really try and be a bit slicker about getting that support that, that, that people need on board. So I think the board's heard in the last few meetings about some of the work that the team's done with uh, the, the sort of actual physical space. And we've got quite a nice portfolio of, um, of things done, but also a really big pipeline of, of um, projects coming up and actually on the walkabouts with BG with length of that list even more so that they're very much in demand and it might just be worth sharing some photographs of the various rooms that the, the, the charity because they're really passionate about it and, and i know they do a really good job so i'll, I'll send those around board to have a look and you can see the various spaces around the trust that they've transformed because it's made a real difference marcus i just i just want i think it's a fantastic um development and uh I've had the pleasure of sitting on that panel to, to make some of the decisions around the charity fund, and it's always one of the most fun meetings of the week. Um, but I think it's hard and around the world new, but I think probably you can challenge yourself to see how can we do it across all the work, uh, the elderly wards, and also community hospitals to explore just to make sure it's equal across the whole, the whole trust. I think it'd be, be a worthwhile exercise. Yeah, that's just the point I was going to raise. But Steve, anything you want to say from the charity? Uh, Point of view. This is the second example in just two or three weeks where picked up a, where the, the charity has has funded something which has then led to quite a significant piece of activity across the uh, the trust. Not, not a great lot to add to what uh, Ross mentioned. I think you can really see it to believe it. The, the photographs are amazing. They really do um, make the whole thing just look a little less clinical and institutional and a lot more uh, human for, for, for people um, so how well we can roll that out elsewhere is, is important but I also think it's important that we um, continue the conversation with volunteers and active wards um, because creating those spaces uh, can also be a great opportunity to have different people using those spaces um, facilitated by, by our great volunteers. That's great. Any more for any more. Um, warmly commending the work and a really interesting story. Nice to see, incidentally, that it originated from War 24 in North Tyneside, so it'd be nice for them to get a bit of credit for the idea. Uh, but I think we've, we're concluding with Marcus that uh, rollout is going to be important. If this is good, if we have evidence that improves outcomes and it makes staff feel good, then we've got no reason not to be trying to roll it out more widely. Um, uh, across the estate, um, using it as the opportunity for uh, encouraging, engaging volunteers as well. I know at times there's been actually a shortage of volunteer roles, but that's something I'm sure the charity will be uh, looking at. And let's commend the charity also for increasingly moving towards their investments. And I think of them as investments as, as strategic, uh, having an impact on the way we work. Moni. Um, just really, I thank you for having a ten point um, for doing something like this, clearing a team um, up absolutely nailed it with this. And I think as well, just credit to Jane Blackburn and other people as well, because it was a true sort of quadrumperate um, discussion, uh, because everybody was involved. And I think if we're going to try and sell this out to other people, um, clearing a team, you know, this has been a real success, I Good. think. Let's capture Claire. Claire's name and title as well as we'll manage it. Yeah, right. Okay, Joe, I've been keep protecting you from the mic for as long as I could without anybody else to comment. I'm afraid you're back on with patient and staff experience. Why don't you make a event of report and only pick out a handful of headlines? But it does speak for itself here. Yeah, I think. Um, <coughs> sorry. If I'm going to take the main headlines, I think. Overall, our patient perspective is continues, which is our right time measurement that we do two weeks post-discharge with inpatients, outpatients, 
community. I think overall we've got good performance. I think point of note is our inpatient. So particularly around, um, we see a drop in school for NSEC overall. But when we dive down into the questions, we see um, particularly it relates to waiting for a bed um, and the discharge process in terms of how we consult with families and arrangements once that, um, with social care. For me, I think we've triangulated that, and I brought that to SQI, and I talked about how we triangulated that with the inpatient, the National Inpatient Survey, where we were able to see a similar performance around one of our five questions where we've seen the strongest, the, the significant deterioration, sorry, it was in relation to that question, waiting for a bed. So I think we would never say that's good, but it gives us reassurance in terms of the data that we collect, that we see the same pattern. There is some work happening at the moment, so my team are working strongly in partnership with um, <coughs> Marcus's team around um, improving the experience and around improving decompression patients. So that would directly um, have a relationship with that. Um, Again, just another point to note in terms of ED, we continue to 24 out of the 27 questions were within the top 20%. But a point of note is if we look by size at NSEC, and ED has the six out of seven data points being below the top 20%. Um, but it's just sad that we have recently introduced the new real-time ED measurement program, which gives us some real um, insights into the thing. So understanding patient stories from the way but what we see is that actually once patients are in to ED, the care they receive, they report a really positive experience and the team are looking at that data very closely and are making some changes particularly around, for example, the live board that patients say that they would like. So we're looking at that, they look the team are looking at that at the moment. Um, our real time score correlates very closely with the inpatient patient perspective that our patients, once in the bed, um, report high quality care across the board. Um, and December seen some of our highest scores, and particularly the overall domain score, um, and for four of our areas, which were involvement, food, medication, and noise at night. Um, and then just to finish off the staff survey, we we're wasting the final results for the national survey. Our performance in terms of responsiveness was was excellent. Um, we had the, we were the highest acute and acute community provider, and at the moment in our local survey, we're sitting the smaller, a bit lower than where we would want to be. So we're just under four thousand, which is a little bit lower than this time next year. But we're hopeful of at least equaling an average score around four thousand by the end of the week, which is the date first. Lots of positive news in this, as usual, we'll probably want to well, we'll focus a bit on the positive, but also on the learning. Uh, Pisha, you also want to... Yeah, so just um, from the real-time patient experience, Joe will be very humble in this, but setting off the ED real-time patient experience, I think is a real benefit for the organisation. Because the patient perspective data is slightly delayed in terms of the timing of how it's fed back to our clinical teams. You could see how sometimes they would be trying to work out what else was going on at the time, what was the contextual information provided in terms of those results. I think what the real-time information gives us is the ED team being able to act straight away in terms of the things that it's telling us. So pain management, for example, was something that was triggering on that real-time experience. The team encompassed that straight away, it took on board a couple of improvement cycles. The following real-time patient experience, we saw that figure go up. Unfortunately, the one area that continues to be a problem is around the time to be seen and the waiting times. And I know we've had quite an extensive discussion at FIT this morning around some of the things that we might need to look at to try and improve, improve that within our own ED. Thank you for that, and I think really important for us to be focusing on the improvement because I mean we've been getting pain management has been a problem for ages now. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Joe. I just want to ask, well, Chair, that um, the patients and um, reception of of the, of the, the methodology the, of methodology that we're using to call patients forty eight hours after a visit to ED. Patients are really open, really willing to take part, and really welcome the opportunity to talk. We've not had 
people who didn't want to do it was just being graced as well. But most people want to be able to speak yeah. about their experience. Alice. Just on the pain, and I think it's where we need to be careful with how we look at ED feedback. For somebody who's got a new fracture or who is going to be admitted, it's going to be their pain needs need to be met. There are a number of people who turn up to ED with long-term problems who want an instant or a, a rectification of their pain where it would be inappropriate to meet their needs simply because they should be met outside a four-hour accident emergency emergency Bit. And so we'll never get that perfect because actually then we would actually be straying into areas that are not actually a part of uh, an ED uh, appropriate clinical response. And so we need to delineate, I think, between the two because actually there is a bit where a number of people are actually inappropriately turning up to ED for analgesia for a long-term condition rather than acute. And so it's how do we differentiate that in terms of uh, the patient feedback so, so we hit the right spot rather than trying to hit everything. Thank you, Alistair. Richard and then Chris. So, comments and then probably a request. Um, patient feedback committee has been having a bit of a deep dive on food, which is consistently the weakest domain score. Um, and you know, it's become very clear this is a complex issue um, and there's no simple answer um, that will make that, that get better. What was interesting in it, at least for me, was that it was led to three questions. I hope I'm getting my data right here, Joe. Uh, two of which scored extremely well, and one of which scored really quite badly. Um, and that's lost a little bit sometimes when you look at averages. And I think we perhaps picked up on that sometime with the, um, with the survey of uh, events that you talked about earlier. Just occasionally, not at ward level, but at trust level, it would be good actually to see the question level data, just to make sure we're not missing important things when we're looking at these domain averages. Okay, that's really helpful. Chris? I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate that phone call the two days after the attended DD or it's doable, I think, but it just strikes me we've got a good opportunity, or potential good opportunity there to do some education, to do some informing around, you came to ED this time, but have you thought about other, other routes and other, other routes into getting care next time? And, using that as an opportunity for that conversation. I think there is also on that point, Chris and Joe and I have had this conversation about almost testing out elements of our clinical strategy mm -hmm. through that conversation because the narrative on the that Joe and the team get from the real-time conversations mm -hmm. lead to a number of questions to say, in the future, if we had done this, would you yeah. have still been a positive outcome? So I think there's a real link of what we're finding out now, but also how that could inform a future strategy moving forward. Joe, are you comfortable about that, adding potential extra functions into the real-time process? Yeah, because I think it's something similar that we do um, via our, our right-hand measurement program, just talk to palms, small about slops, it's, and it's the, it's the beauty of the agility of the, the methods that we use. So, for example, ringing people and asking questions means that just as Beatrice has described and Chris is talking about, that we're able to explore certain areas because it's that human to human discussion. But similarly with some of the other methods that we use that we recently switched to digital, we're, we're about to slot potentially five questions in for our patients around doctor doctor, which we'll do very short and then take them out again. So I think it's yeah, it's follows a pattern that we do anyway, so yeah. That's great. Okay. More for any more. Um, that was really useful. Um, uh, overall, strongly encouraging the data from uh, patient experience, encouraging also <coughs> that the level of staff um, sign up, we'll get the results of that um, later on. Um, noticing some of those figures that are still kind of lower, uh, we're properly focusing on them. But meanwhile, I do think we should congratulate Hexham on their inpatient data. Hexham in particular on the ED data that came out uh, top and Blythe that came out top on our patients. It would be nice to recognise them in a minute and maybe uh, if our colleagues are content just drop a note uh, to uh, people to say that we, we've noticed uh, how well they've uh, done on that. Um, uh, the, the, the point that Richard raised about every now and again digging down deeper and looking at the question level, I think Joe is taking that on board and will reflect that in the future. And Jim, as usual, thank you very much indeed for your input. Are you ready? Good to move on? Um, and I love these bits, the um, board walkabouts. So the first one, um, uh, 
Bernie, you were in one spec. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was a little while ago, it was just uh, back in November, but just due to the board reporting cycle, this is our first opportunity. So Alistair kindly uh, accompanied me and showed me around uh, one spec. It was a relatively early morning, uh, certainly for Annette. <laughs> <It was, laughs> I'm guessing many of them were there much earlier. <laughs> but I was there about 8 30, 8 40, and uh, was able to observe just how the, the general hospital ambience was. It was clearly getting busy progressively. I mean, there was at that time ample parking, for example. Uh, but you could just sense the hospital kind of getting busier and busier. Um, but it was what was very noticeable, particularly from a staff point of view, well, as I was just looking around the corridors and then the, the sort of cafe, everybody was smiling, everybody looked happy. Uh, there was one or two players who were singing. So it was really just the kind of first impressions were great. Uh, Alice and I spent some time with the volunteer service at the, at the front door. They were just gearing up and getting their shop ready. And I think uh, they were really uh, grateful for the time we spent with them, Alistair, I think. Uh, uh, so that was great. Um, and it just brings all the things we've been talking about, the importance of the volunteers. Uh, we should never, we don't ever underestimate their contribution. But the, the real purpose of our visit was to, uh, we had a look at the urgent treat, treatment centre first. Um, it was certainly not our capacity, but it was it was get, it was steady, but it was clearly under uh, good control, very calm, uh, and we got the chance to talk to uh, two or three of the staff in there. Um, and what was immediately evident was the kind of strong team spirit in that unit. It was really, really so uh, evident. Uh, great team spirit, very happy, they were delighted with a new uh, staff room facility that had been moved and relocated, so that had gone down a storm. And what was really noticeable was the impact of the maiden, uh, Maria, uh, who I think you, you and I met uh, when we was at North Tyneside Urgent Treatment, I think she oversees both. Uh, she is clearly a star, uh, is so... Uh, well respected by the staff and have a great positive impact. Uh, what was really noticeable as well from the feedback from the staff was the patient, uh, the ability for patients to book a slot. Uh, that was really been well received by patients and by the staff. And the role of the embedded GP there, I think we spoke to her and she was really, really complimentary and that was clearly having another positive impact. Um, so overall, that was a, that was a, a, a visit to the urgent treatment centre. Um, uh, there was an issue before we wanted it. Whilst they've got a, a, a more modernised UTC, they've still sort of got the old fashioned kind of workstation. And that's really not completely fit for purpose. And as when there's any opportunity, maybe it's just to try and reconfigure the ergonomics of that would be, would be particularly helpful. Uh, yeah. So then we had a look around at uh, radiology. Um, it, it was uh, immaculately clean, it was inviting, it was about half full, I would say, the waiting area. And clearly the staff were all uh, otherwise occupied with patients, which was great. So we didn't get a lot of chance. But we had a bit chat with the, the receptionist, which is always a good sort of barometer as the mood and uh, the staff, and she was wonderful. Uh, she was very accommodating, was keen to go and get somebody, but we didn't want to abstract people away from from patients, so we didn't spend too much time there. Uh, and then we had a look around at the cardiology investigation unit, uh, and it was evidentially quiet, uh, observationally, but the staff were very keen to tell us that that was highly unusual, <laughs> so that was not the norm. Uh, but that did give us a chance to get much more great uh, staff engagement, and Stacey, the, uh, the nurse in charge, uh, spent some considerable time with us, which was great. Uh, very engaging, showed us around the unit, very proud of, of their unit. Clearly that unit has expanded its geographical footprint across the, the, the it's a little bit disjointed and uh, as and when you know opportunities arise in the future that's a, a possible opportunity but uh, they were certainly not complaining about the extra space that they had uh, managed to get. Um, they did some great work about regional echo training uh, Stacey was leading that and she was super enthusiastic and I think there was massive opportunities collaboratively there, I think it was fair to say, all the step four, 
for the unit for the region in terms of that development. So that was great. So overall, really, really positive, um, positive visit. Uh, super hospital, magnificently clean, uh, positive vibe everywhere. Really good staff engagement, good morale. Uh, one or two little bits and pieces around. You know, as always, opportunity to relocate computers and. Uh, but nothing can be any significant concern on certain notions of escalation. Excellent. Comments, questions? On the principle, it's always nice to have picked up something which we can then improve. Can we tackle the card reader issue? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm delighted to say that I have now got a card reader. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really helpful intelligence. And actually, I know the volunteers who do, they have them in the shop, but they didn't traditionally have them in the trolley. Um, but it's making a real difference, and I was able to like it to get one. So thank you. Just, just on that look, I mean, it sounded a really small thing, Jack, got it, but oh, the, the volunteers were really passionate that like, they had an experience on the trolley where a patient couldn't buy some sweets. Yeah. And she didn't have any visitors. And you know, okay. whilst it wasn't going to miraculously change her medical condition, it certainly made a big impact on her patient experience. So it's a little thing but massive impact, I think. Right. So thanks for so much. Anything more on that walkabout? Thank you very much indeed, Bernie. Uh, the next one, Ruth went with Jeremy. So Jeremy. Uh, we've all read it, of course, um, but any all the headlines? Gosh, you just reminded me that Ruth, Ruth isn't there, so we... Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, do you want, do you want to skip on to the next one? So we, um, we, we visited um, uh, the uh, MESOP, the Mental Health Ward, um, uh, and also uh, um, the, uh, the stroke unit at um, North Tyneside. Um, and um, absolutely fantastic facility, really. We were just talking when we were talking about the patient experience, about a very, very well designed space for patients, um, a very bespoke um, way of uh, dealing with, you know, quite a diverse and uh, at times challenging group, but, you know, really fantastic. Very well set up, very well stuck, very well organised. We then went down to um, uh, Stroke Ward. Uh, they were very, very pleased um, that they had all stroke patients on, 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 on the stroke ward, and that was quite uh, uh, and, and I, I have to say, it was an extremely busy, uh, uh, busy ward, um, and there's clearly a lot of therapy focus in terms of the patients, and uh, lots and lots of therapists around there, which we were talking about. Um, and really, I think that probably is the area that is going to prove most challenging going forward. The, there are some changes in the therapy targets that um, either have come or will be coming very, very, very sort of with, with uh, going from an hour, I think, to three hours of therapy time. And that is challenging, particularly if you can the face side. And one of the things that struck me, and I'm sort of pleased I'm sitting next to Marion, who chairs our um, NMAC board, is that um, I think we're fantastically well organised for apprenticeships and nursing. <coughs> it does strike me that we, we, we could apply some of the solutions that we've managed from nursing to our AHPs and OTs and, and speech and language would be absolutely and certainly one of the things that the uh, staff talk to me about is they have, they, have to, they have to have three lots of drugging, no specialised therapists. Um, and uh, I was very taken by the idea of having some systems who could work with them across all three. Uh, so I do think there's a number of opportunities. Now, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, so uh, definitely something we're looking into with the team. Works very well for nursing, and it's just about replicating that. And we've been discussing it as we talk and then we need to get on it. So it's an ongoing discussion. Good, sounds like a, a positive step. And the and the um, World 22 needing a facelift is that included in the plan and kind of plan? So when is it likely to happen? I think Ward 23 is first, and then it will be Ward 22. Actually, yeah, sorry, Mark. Well, 23 needs a bit of finishing off work. It's all about how we decamp the water on the NSEX, on the dot so we're busy working with that plan when it starts. 
Good. So you, you sort of have got that focus on, on rehab workers. I mean, <coughs> certainly endorse the efforts to, to make the push. And rehab assistance, I suspect, is going to be an important part of, of the solution. Anything more on that? And if not, we're moving into... Katie, you were also at North Townside. Yes, I was, but I got to have a lion and like learn it. <laughs> <laughs> so I so much more fun. Um, yeah, Marion took me around, and firstly, um, Marion's just a brilliant leader, and it's just lovely to see the staff engagements and the pleasure that Marion was there. So that, that was just wonderful to see. Um, I suppose the key points it was a really detailed uh, walk around, which was fantastic. In the orthopaedics ward, the ward manager had 101 great ideas on how to improve patient experience, make it easier, better for staff, and it was just lovely to see that she was taking those ideas and she was given, following on from what Joe was saying earlier on, given the opportunity to start to implement and test those ideas. So it was lovely just to see that enthusiasm. Um, talking to the volunteers in reception, um, I actually caught up with one the other day and so enjoyed working uh, or supporting the trust that now is working for NHS um, as a quarter, which is again lovely to see that transition from that support. Um, one of the concerns from the volunteers was how to encourage staff and visitors to wash their hands. Um, obviously, wanting to ensure that there's that cleanliness, but just how do you approach people who aren't exactly doing as they should be doing in, in a safe way? So, again, it's just thinking through training others to support how to encourage that whilst making sure volunteers are, are safe in what they're doing. Uh, it was also great to have a really good discussion with a real mix of staff. Um, themes that are coming through is they were all clear on our strategy and they were clear on how to raise concerns and have no issues at all with raising concerns. They're really pleased with comments and understand what's going on and we just enjoy what they were doing, which is lovely. And then the only other real issue was in the social day unit, and I think Ruth may have picked this up previously, um, was about how um, information was a paper list for those who were going through to the next day, and it's where for you know, concerns about data management, efficiency, human error. Um, and I know IMT already, Andrew was saying earlier on, he's already just picked up on this, and whether there are ways of ensuring that any follow-ups, comments? Uh, Andrew, yeah. So let's pick up on that issue because it was raised in a public board last year as well from, I think it was Phil and Ruth on the floor about. Right? So I think we understand the issue with that, which is the, the they're doing this manual planning and it's because um, patients only go into the system when their wristbands printed and so there's sort of apparently obvious solution to push all the data through earlier to get them to do the job and mess up all of the real-time occupancy data so we don't want to do that. We did think through IMT committee that there was a good opportunity to actually go out and talk to some of those users and understand how it works and whether we can do anything about it which has been done and the conclusion to that was it's not clear that kind of building another solution around all of that would really good thing to do and that the people who are doing it at the moment are doing it in a vaguely consistent way and aren't massively unhappy with it. So it's still a bit open in my mind but we have actually used it as an opportunity to get out and talk to some real people about that. It's, the, it's one of those sort of raggy edges around the systems that is understood. This may be a slightly different issue but I do think we need to think about what we're doing with hand washing on the long term yeah. market with regards to CQC. We're probably in Eakin being the only trust with hand washing facilities as you walk in. It's not a mandatory thing in the NHS. We've got some staff who wash on the wards. We've got some staff who appear to bypass it because they know they're going to the ward. But I think from a CQC and a consistency, we're just we're never going to get everybody washing hands as they walk in the building, with unless you've got volunteers to pre that, and that's not going to be the case. So maybe not for now, but I think at some point we need to actually come to a consensus as to what we're doing, because I think we're open to criticism, which may or may not be appropriate because of it, um, and it does lead to inconsistencies. And we need to also think about this not with regards to 
COVID prevention, where I think the evidence is debatable, but with regards to diarrheal illness and those sort of things, which is much more pertinent and the evidence is much stronger for. So I think the messaging also needs to be thought about. So maybe not for now, but I do think we need to throw that sooner rather than later, because an inspector and indeed in the mock inspection, it came up with regards to that. Lots of nodding heads. How will we handle that rather than try to tackle it right now? Uh, Phil? So, yeah, yeah, we had a, um, a session lined up for 5th in February, which was to look at the whole uh, issue of front entrance and the consistency about the staffing of the volunteers. And we'll probably pick up the hand washing question. Okay, let's make sure we do right. If we can make sure we do yeah. that, we really well. Um, uh, it was just on um, Andrew's point, just to include the procedure unit and sick on top of that as well, because they have planned cases that they create lists on, so it's just to incorporate that in the user testing um, in terms of what would be appropriate, what would be, because they do list patients we know in advance the day before. It might be the difference between planned patients and emergency patients that allows one it's just to incorporate that into any of that sort of scoping work that we do. Okay. Um, so really, really helpful. I think we know how we're going to approach hand washing. Or we will we will know in, in uh, February. We know that we've looked into the uh, IMT related issues and we haven't really got a solution yet, unfortunately. Um, I thought it was really helpful that Katie pursued some of the um, uh, those other questions about do you have free, freedom to speak up mm -hmm. and whatever and can I just kind of point that up to Neds as they go around it's the kind of question I think could be quite useful I and mean, indeed to other two executives as well I suspect they already do but a reminder to those of us who are going out good kind of question to ask I think um, and I appreciate the way Katie particularly highlighted in this case Marion so let's note that um, but particularly actually for people aren't there. Um, I picked up that Maria was uh, congratulated from in Wandsbeck. I, I am going to start from here sending a, a note to people that have been particularly highlighted within the board. So this is also, I guess, a, a kind of a, a prompt to Neds and their walkabouts. If you identify somebody you think it would be particularly good, I'll look to send a note on behalf of the board. Thank you for the contribution. Good. Um, then the final one, um, uh, uh, would have been Alan, but it's Bijou. Yes, so um, Alan didn't have an early start either. This was a, <laughs> a late, a late afternoon, half <laughs> four ish type, uh, so it was just in time for him to be able to get in uh, at North Tyneside. And we went to Ward 15 and uh, Oncology Day Unit. Um, ward 15 is a GI inpatient ward, a very positive visit. We met a new, a uh, fairly new. Um, senior nurse there, band six there, who has um, worked in the trust for quite a long time, but he was new to Ward 15. Um, very complimentary in terms of the team working that that ward has. So historically, GI at North Times, and we are talking a couple of years back, had struggles recruiting, um, arguably because of also some of the patient cohort that was sometimes uh, on that board, but actually a really, really positive change in leadership there has really given a very positive uh, experience for both staff and patients on that ward, and it's seen as one of our um, high achieving wards. And then secondly, we went to um, the Oncology Day Unit. Again, as you would expect, phenomenal experience there for um, patients who can be now, given the changing regimes, uh, on the unit for quite some time, for quite a length of time, because of the change in the treatment schedules now. Um, if, we're, if we're mentioning people, Deborah Fern yeah, was yeah. there, who has been there for 100 years, and she won't mind me saying that. She was there when I first started as an OSM 20 years ago, so that really does put it into context. A phenomenal team, she's retired and come back. A uh, very flexible team, as you would expect, in terms of patients that might need that slightly longer treatment and um, more than willing to stay back and support so that those patients can have their treatment done, have their treatment undertaken locally and completed. So a really positive um, visit to the end of the day there. Great, great. Questions or comments? Congratulations to Deborah. Yeah. Good. Then that was a really nice and really stimulating set of uh, walkabouts. Um, let's move on. I'm assuming she's just gone to fetch. Is Matt coming to speak? Yeah. Uh, 
and just to say the staff really appreciate the non-exec walkabouts. I know sometimes it might feel like oh God, we're bothering people here, but they really, really do appreciate and they love showing off their units and they will always talk to you very candidly. You will sometimes see the execs stand back. That's not because we're not interested, but we want the teams to feel that they can say anything to you without any of the execs or senior users being around. So they are very much appreciated. Okay, good. Well, we're on to the Apprentice story, and we're joined by um, uh, Matt Dawson. Matt, Matt, welcome. This is a chance not only for us to focus on what you've managed to do, and you know, congratulations to you for getting the award, but for us to think a little bit more widely about what it means the apprenticeship program within uh, the Trust, but uh, a really helpful paper. Do you want to introduce it? Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Peter Dawson. Um, Today I'm just going to speak about my apprenticeship journey, uh, but also highlight apprenticeships in general because I feel like they're very important to the trust. Um, and I also will give a brief backstory of how I've joined the trust in my journey so far. So I joined when I was 17, um, fresh from university, not university, high school. Um, and I was a little bit nervous. I'm still nervous now, to be honest with you. Like said, but, um, I was nervous back when um, I, I couldn't even answer the phone. Um, I, I needed that support, but the apprenticeship team and my line managers were really supportive of my journey and when I first started. Um, I had two placements within my first year, so one was medical records and then the second one was uh, the apprenticeship team. Uh, I completed that and I got a permanent job within the learning development team um, and I didn't realise the opportunities that would go beyond that, so I um, enrolled under my apprenticeship level three business admin, completed that um, and after that, I again didn't realise the opportunities to progress further in a different field. So there was around IT, there was project management, there was leadership, there was management. Um, and I progressed into the project management group because that's what I was introduced to, that was the, the work I was doing. Um, but also the opportunities that were a part of the apprenticeship. So I was given the opportunity to become a uh, staff governor, which I still am right now. So I'm representing Cobalt and Learning Development, occasionally attend committee meetings um, in the, the general board of governance meetings as well. And it's a good insight for myself personally, my aspirations beyond that, um, getting a insight into the strategic element of the trust, which I found quite interesting and I still do. Um, and after my computer level four project management diploma, and I progressed into a degree after that, which I'm still currently on a level five and six degree. And my aspirations is to become a, a manager one day, and I got that opportunity um, August when I was seconded into a post. Um, so I'm managing one member of staff now and actually good time of the day I'm actually managing a business admin apprentice who's not in the trust. So hopefully my experience will then be able to give him some, some support in any ways. Um, so I'm really happy that I've been given that opportunity and I can't progress in that field. And then going beyond that, I'm hoping to do my masters in project management or strategic leadership because again that's my aspirations. Um, so to be honest, I didn't really know what else to say, apart from the opportunities that the apprenticeship team have provided me, my managers and um, my colleagues as well. So I'm, I'm really happy to have been given the opportunity to do many apprenticeships and I'm still going to progress in that field as well. That's just great. It's a really clear presentation as well. And Kate, you'll want to pick up on that. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Well done. So Matt's part of my team, and uh, <laughs> Matt's probably one of the reasons why I do the job I do in his story. So he came in at 17, and he's now in a band at six. But the thing about Matt is, it talks about the support of the apprenticeship team, but he grasps every single opportunity, and has worked, and works really hard, and takes every opportunity. So I think that's a credit to you, Matt, because it takes that tenacity to do that. And I think sometimes the younger generation get a bit of a bad rep, but... I think Matt's a really good example and a really good role model for all the other friendships. So well done. Well done, Matt. Great. I've got a few and then Bernie. So again, well done, Matt. Um, I have to say I was historically quite a traditional person in terms of you go to school, you go to school, you go to university, and then you go and get a job. And I think that my eyes over the last few years have really become open, particularly with regards to alternative ways of I think really focusing on individuals and their learning styles and what works for them rather than going on that kind of, for some people that journey is great, for others there are other routes to really progress and I think your enthusiasm, your point Kate about grasping everything 
in terms of opportunities, fantastic. Uh, I think there's something about getting out to school. Sorry, we're going to end up using you as a test. But getting out to schools to show people there is an alter I think it's just starting to get out there in schools now, but really showing that there are alternative ways to do well, but not necessarily going through the university route if that doesn't work for you. And I think it's helpful for um, people at school to see individuals like that, not the likes of me going in, but individuals who are partway through the process that have done well come from school. I think it's really important that we do that. Kate stole me First of all, I think what an incredible uh, presentation that's so well done. To come to a board as a young, young person, young in your career, to come to a board like this and pitch as well as you've done. Well done, what a credit, fantastic job. I mean, I was a little bit nervous doing this one. You've done a fantastic job, you should be proud of yourself you. to be able to come and do that, so well done. But I think in terms of the the, the power of, you know, an advocate and somebody like Matt and many of us to be able to go and talk to other young people, I think will be far more powerful than the kind of old fuzzy does you like me. Type of thing, you know? So well done, that would be you. fantastic. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Again, well done, Matt. And I still get nervous every time I have to speak. <laughs> so it will stick. So, but really well done. I'll just say that you know, Matt's not the only apprentice. So doing a walk about at Nelson Medical Group uh, last week, and there was a receptionist who started as an apprentice, and he's now a healthcare assistant there. So you know, you're not the only one that it's really working for. It's lovely. Jack, I don't know. Thanks, Matt. That was absolutely amazing. And just to say, it, echo what Katie says, it's, it's always good to be nervous. Start worrying when you're not there. <laughs> um, I was just really interested to know: um, Did you know what you wanted to be when you were leaving school? And, and if not, how has the apprenticeship helped you in terms of what would you say is the one key benefit in that in that journey? So I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and luckily my auntie worked in the trust, and I didn't realise the NHS actually had it apprenticeships on offer. I, I, I thought apprenticeships was that manual labour element of it. So when I got recommended to do it, I said, worst case scenario, I get a qualification at the end of it, and that experience, best case, I'll really enjoy it and I'll progress, and that's what I've, I've done. So, But the, the one thing that's kind of stood out for me is the, the level of support you get from the apprenticeship team on your first week of induction. To then your, your senior manager, your, your, your colleagues who are helping you along the way as well. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't really want to answer the phone, I didn't want to pick them up. Um, and then the, the level of task, it's a hard transition from high school to a working job because you're so used to being with your friends and talking, just having a joke around, but now it's like, it's serious because it's work. So probably the, that's the main point that sticks out with me is that level of support that you get. Okay. Thank you, Matt, and as everybody else has said, brilliant story. I'm really interested in where the challenges have been. You've really showcased what was really good. So from a, from a board's perspective, where were the low lights and what could we do to have supported you maybe a little bit better? I think that first kind of six months come in, because you've got to pick up so much roles and responsibilities, and then it's, it's down to the person, the individual as well, so the the apprentice that I've, I'm managing now is really confident, but if that doesn't say it's for everyone as well, it's not everyone's not confident by the first, you know, get a, a full time job. So, I, although I say that level of support is really good, I'd probably say you know a little bit extra training around confidence building, and um, just networking really, um, because it, it's it, like I said, it's different for that apprentice in that specific department because you don't know what they're doing on a day to day basis. So I'd probably say. The, the confidence element of it. That's great, thank you. Um, Marcus and then I think you should be really, really proud of yourself today. Um, and I think you've done a fantastic job, so well done you. I think I'm delighted you're interested in being a manager of the future. Yeah, I'm now getting eyes down the board then. Um, I just want to ask you a question because there was a little bit you said there about you didn't realise you had opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think it should just be helpful from your reflection what do you think we can maybe do differently so people like yourself know there's opportunities because you're the future and we need people like yourself applying and coming through. So just wonder if there's anything there for about that. Well, I, when I was in high school, I don't think we had the opportunities that you know the NHS come into my high school, for example, but we do that now. So I think it's just that transition from how we're advertising our uh, apprenticeships. But we are doing it now. Um, but when I was in high school, I don't think it was available to me. 
there was other companies, but it wasn't the NHS coming into my high school. Thank you. Margaret, thank you for asking that question because it's Margaret, really key. Yeah, because we get a lot of work, work experience places and I get feedback, you know, individuals like Matt who are in school where you, you can't go to the toilet unless you ask and you can't do that. that we, we all think that's okay, we can, but they actually ask that question, when can I go to the toilet, when can I have my lunch? And it's the transition from school to work, which is really difficult. So I think you're right, Matt, that extra support at the start of that journey would be really helpful, I think, for a lot of people. And if you come and do work experience, we are trying to track those that come do work experience, start in a role with us and where they, they go and like all that experience. So we'll pick that up, thank you. Hi. Uh, just very proud of you, um, really good. I just wondered, Matt, just because you started in medical records, uh, you know, a, a while ago, didn't you? Yes. I mean, yeah. And I just wondered if you felt that that gave you a good grounding because it is quite different from other parts of the trust. I just wondered, um, you know, because we're very keen to have apprentices in there and we haven't always had them. Mm. It was a good environment for me because it was a, a, a chance to get the grasp of, of, of medical records to start as, and it had a little different elements to it. So you're on your feet, you're at your desk. And I think that was a good sound point, but I'm not sure now because it we're all digital, that it wouldn't have that opportunity yeah. to do that yeah. and yeah. get up like that. So. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I think we're done. It's nice to get such a good news item as well. Um, so glad we managed to get to a couple of bits of learning, one greater support in the first six months in particular, and the other thinking further about awareness within schools for the, you know, recruiting the next generation. Um, I noticed as well in your presentation you talked about Kirsty Ford and the support she gave, so she's just been added to the list of the uh, uh, individual <laughs> notes that will go out. Uh, sending the thanks to the board, um, uh, but you've already had enough. I don't want to swell you away. Any more, Matt? No, not from probably. But thank you very much for listening, everyone. But if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to email. That's great. That's all. I'll see thank you on Wednesday at the government's meeting. Yes. Good. Then let's move straight on, shall we? Um, Kirsty's calling. So uh, for the feeling to speak up dashboard and strategy, uh, Kate's going to take us. Thank you, yeah, Kirsty can't make it today, so I was just going to run through the uh, dashboard. So just for a bit of background, the Freedom to Speak Up dashboard does come through People and Culture Committee. We had a, it was, we had a good in-depth dive on the dashboard. So there's a couple of areas which I just wanted to pick up. So I've just lost my... Um, cases have risen from last year to this year, which we had a bit of a debate in the committee about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. I think intelligence suggests it's a good thing because people feel that they can speak up and they can go to Kirsty. Um, but we had a conversation, Richard raised it, about the responsibility of leaders in this and Kirsty can take the, take the concerns and the, the issues that are raised but it's up to the leaders to change the culture on this so we've been tasked with an action to look into that a little bit further and how we can further implement that within the Trust. One of the other main areas um, on the dashboard that I just wanted to raise was around, I um, think Kirsty reported around detriment for speaking up. So that's hugely concerning. Yes, it was. And as part of the discussion that we had at People and Culture, we've enacted a process to look at those cases and what detriment was received and whether we need to look at those into those formally or not. Um, I think um, to have it. Obviously, it's very subjective detriment, and we have, I do have examples where people have raised it and we have followed formal process, and although we potentially have come to an outcome where we can't find any evidence, it doesn't change how that individual feels about that process. So we are looking into some of those cases um, just for assurance at the board. Um, there's also some comments on there that Curtis has included around learning from feedback, and again, wanted to raise the challenges, so around... I was promised a buddy, but it didn't happen. Uh, better support's needed for staff who raised concerns. So we've asked Kirsty again to raise those with us immediately so we can do something about those, about those concerns. Um, we are looking at, we've got a policy for Speak Up. It's currently being um, revised. We, it needs to be done by the end of January. We've got a couple of days. We're just in, um, including the sexual safety element into the Speak Up policy and just trying to make that really clear that um, that's another avenue to speak up and I think Kirsty had initial concerns about um, 
she doesn't access the uh, email address and so didn't want any confusion around the speaker. So we just need to make that clear within the policy. Um, in terms of the strategy, um, I'm probably mixing the two up if that's the right call, just because it's on the dashboard. Yeah. But in terms of the strategy, the plan on the page has been to board before and we're working in the background on a narrative around that. So we're, that's work in progress at the minute and we hope we, hope we can bring that back um, in the future, very soon future to bring that back. I think what we need to do though, and I, hopefully Melissa's got it on the board development, is the board reflection tool to enable us to develop the final bit of that strategy. So that needs to be at board development before we can finalise it um, with Kirsty. Um, there's statistics on there around people who've accessed the training as well, um, and then how Kirsty reports. And I guess just to say a really big well done to Kirsty because Bernie and I did challenge her to Put our information into a dashboard again it's work in progress but i think as you can see it's definitely improved and developed and um, i think there, there's some there's probably some data issues that we'll, we'll talk through and just um make sure we're representative but i think it gives the overall general sense that the board need yes good i, I was pleased to see the dashboard i didn't understand the the, the charts on the left hand side of with arrows and cogs, but yes. that's, that's the work in progress area. Yes. I suspect yeah. there's probably one or two others. I've got Phil in them uh, in their months. Okay, just on the detriment, yes. yeah, it's concerning to see that increase. And I, I appreciate that we will try and follow up the individual cases to find out what has happened there. I just wonder whether we need to issue something to managers just to remind them that as part of this process that we've got, you know, that, that should not happen and that we will follow up in instances where that is reported back because it's not it's not just about what happened on the ones we've got it's to try and prevent it in future it's, it's always good to remind managers about and i think yeah. the the, de the detriments of, there's a scale of detriment as to the, they've spoken up and because the concerns they've raised they'll feel that maybe something's happened as a result or we get you know someone <coughs> might not be speaking to them to the point where people have to potentially say i really want to move areas so there's a scale and we absolutely have to look at them and and take all of them, as we do through our normal policies. Okay, let's just check if anybody agrees with that. I certainly did, because if so, we wanted to note into the board decision yeah. that we're asking you to send out a note saying Absolutely. that the board is concerned to see that some yeah. staff probably doesn't need a percentage, that some staff have felt that they were, they've been placed at detriment by using the freedom to speak up, and we just want to emphasise that's not acceptable. We yeah. will be following up and taking appropriate action. My point was just on the general increase in numbers overall, and just a reminder that we've done quite a lot of additional communications around it, so that'll prompt people. And yeah. I think it's not a bad thing, is it? Yeah, and in the outside world, there's been lots of in the news around freedom to speak up, and that probably has prompted people's minds as well. So it's just a couple of factors, I suppose, to <laughs> consider on the increase. Good, okay. Yes, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, just to say, I absolutely agree about sexual safety being included. I think one of the things we will need to do is to ensure that colleagues really understand what that means, yeah. because I think it has different connotations to different people, and I think some people really don't have a very good understanding. And I know there's a lot of exemplars across the NHS around this that we could need to follow. And we, we've got... Um, I think you're absolutely right, and we've got a working group, Margaret, as well, looking at the sexual safety within just specifically and looking into that Paul. Just a, a minor point on the on the growth in numbers. It might be good just to see how staff numbers have changed for so the various staff groups. We are growing the staff. Ben? Yeah, just a very quick point on the numbers chair. It's it's something we're through the, the detailed dialogue and debate at workforce is that it's a good thing on the one hand, but we really want to understand where and why and the patterns and the trends mm -hmm. so never to get complacent so yeah we've done great comms you would expect to see more and that's that and that's the case that's good and welcome to put it's understanding what the numbers are i think it's the crucial thing and we're on that good okay yes so thank you then and just one last comment around the dashboard and the progression that we we do want to try and get that with staff experience so we we know in a lot of concerns being raised in certain areas looking at the staff experience and the in that area and triangulating the data that we've got. Okay, well first of all, um, Joe. 
Yes, just to have a quick point but on the back of Kate's, I think also is to look at the work, the intervention work that the staff experience team do, because I think sometimes as well the nature of some of that work may then have a relationship between people choosing to speak up after you mean an intervention. You'll get involved and as a consequence there will be an increase in Yes, which is off the back of the staff survey, then the intervention, and then that may then have a relationship to people speaking up after that. Yeah, it's a complicated flow, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, just a quick point. I wouldn't mind not for now, but following up on uh, one stat, when it's saying 14% of cases reported, they raised concerns with line managers yeah. before. Is that, so does that mean 80% felt they couldn't talk to the line managers, or 80% connected with? I think yeah, it says that they didn't, and we always try and. I think one of Kirsty's first questions is, "Have you been able to speak to your line manager about this?" Fourteen percent of people have said, "Yes, I have. I don't feel I've got anywhere," and then people said, "No, I want to come to you first. So we always try and encourage that line manager conversation. Okay, um, really pleased that people in culture are really focusing in on on this. So this is kind of second tier. Yeah, we discovered we're probably third or fourth tier really look at it but certainly uh, for, for the board we know that it's getting a proper chilling over at uh, PNC. Um, uh, good to see the progress in the dashboard, noting there's still a bit further progress to go. Good to hear about the stories of the triangulation that, that's kind of zoning down into areas. Good to understand the interface between um, uh, intervention from the patient engagement group and then later on potentially uh, increase in, in numbers. Um, real concern about the figures, 27% showing they felt there'd been a detriment for speaking up, agreed that uh, a message will go out on behalf of the board uh, emphasising that and we know there's more work going on to get uh, uh, underneath that. Um, understanding that an increase in numbers can itself be a positive thing as a consequence of the communication that we've been making. Support for sexual safety becoming incorporated in this. And we'll note that we'll have a board reflection tool coming to a board development session um, near you uh, in the near future. <laughs> we'll have a chance to kind of look further. <coughs> I think that covers that item, which has been helpful discussion. And it takes us into the winter update, I think. Who's taking this for us? Jeremy. Jeremy. So yeah. um, Simon, Simon Eaton, um, our business unit director for uh, medicine is uh, at an inquest, so we put one of his deputies to keep me real and in check. So Simon, uh, this is going to present uh, the first part of um, Thanks, yeah, so uh, Simon is one of the um, acute medicine and infectious diseases consultants of trust, and Jeremy says one of the deputy buds for medicine and emergency care. Um, so I think we're all aware of the significant pressures the NHS has been under in the last. Um, so in the last few months, and I think we're certainly not immune to it here and, and recognise some of these headlines, but I think we will come on to discuss, I think we've you know, probably fared better than a lot of organisations around the country. Just to talk about, so the, the emergency department attends, so there was a, the, last year there was a spike in December of attendances, which of course under a, a lot of pressure at that time, particularly around the Christmas New Year period. What we haven't seen is a spike necessarily, but there's a sustained increase in attendances throughout um, the last um, last few months, um, which has caused uh, the pressure that we've been feeling. And just to look at a bit more um, detail at the um, emergency department attends, um, so this is looking at all types of attendances in the emergency department. So there has been that um, this particular kind of um, um, spikes in attendance, which uh, correspond to the, the 4th, 11th, and 18th of December, which are all Mondays. And then there was also um, subsequent data that there was this, another spike on the 2nd of January as well. And so these areas have, have caused a um, um, particular sort of challenge, I think, in terms of performance. There was a particular period around, I think, between the 9th and 13th of December, um, which was um, quite challenging, I think it's fair to say. Um, Jeremy's going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. And in terms of just from a capacity and demand perspective for those who, who are familiar, so, so the, the routine ED capacity is 47 patient spaces with an additional 12 for escalation giving 49 total, which is excluding the main waiting area. But such has been the demand on the services over the last few, few weeks and months that we've seen frequently had 
100 plus to put, uh, patients in the department for, for often most of the day with the highest number of 135. Um, so that, you know, it's extremely challenging to um, provide patient care in that setting and so very challenging for staff and other patients. Um, in addition to that, we have what we call lodge patients. So those are patients where there's been a decision to admit the patient, but there's no bed for them to go to. Um, so they're called lodge patients. And, and frequently we're seeing up to, um, usually between 20 and 30, but sometimes more than 30 patients who are lodged in the department, which also has a significant impact on flow in the department. We have put various measures in place to try and mitigate that. So in, so that the ED team can focus on the work, the new work that's coming in, which has certainly helped, but it's still from an actual sort of capacity and um, with an ED, it's, um, it still poses a significant um, challenge. Um, in terms of ambulance handover delays, so um, this is looking at hand, ambulance handover delays over 60 minutes, so the target for that is zero. Um, but again, the period up until sort of 15th of December, you can see there that there was some you know, significant number that were over that, which is not where, where we want to be. Um, again, it's a sort of manifestation of general the, the capacity in the department and the flow. From um, the 15th of uh, around that time, we did instigate some measures to, to mitigate that. So there was a slight change in the process, the way the, the ambulance crews handed over. We also had a member of, of NIAS within the ambulance handover area within the emergency department as a pilot um, from Monday to Thursday, which I think has also helped with that. But also that this period, which, which is evident with some later graphs, show that the, um, there was a concerted effort to create capacity within the system running up to Christmas. Um, which has inevitably helped with flow. So I think when you have flow, you don't have that those ambulance delay, delays at that to that level. I think I've seen some data subsequent to the, to the sort of fifth of January, which I think shows and you know, that has been again because of the flow and, and how busy it's been and pressured over the last the last couple of weeks. There has been an increase in some of those delays, but again, it's an ongoing ongoing work to to reduce that to to zero. Just to give a bit of a regional perspective from the emergency department of Thames. So um, you can see so a Northumbria in the in the middle there with in this heat map, you can see there that compared to other providers in the region, um, we know a significant number of attends with the three days there that were um, over eight hundred attends. Um, and most of that has been driven by what we call type three attendance. So those attendances going to the urgent, urgent treatment centres have driven a lot of that, but just shows the pressure um, in the system. Looking at the four hour ED performance, um, so the target being 95% of patients to be treated and discharged or admitted within four hours of arrival. And um, quite a bit of variation, certainly from the average sitting between around to the high 80s. Um, but um, again, that's sort of quite a bit of variation, and I think particularly that's, that's for all, all attendances. Um, high performance between sort of 15th and, and the sort of 25th, and again, that was a bit due to that concerted effort to create capacity with the system pre-Christmas, and so again, when you have flow, the, the, the performance does improve. Um, and again, giving that sort of regional perspective, um, on four hour ED performance. So again, Northumbria and North Tees um, performing um, well compared to the um, rest of the region. Um, so despite the pressures, we're still performing at you notice know, in a certain time level. In terms of bed occupancy, um, so adjusting the, the operational planning guidance has had a target of 92%. Uh, um, and again, between the, the dates shown there in, in December, the trust range somewhere between um, so the 76 and 95 percent. The, the, the chart there on the left is the uh, is from the 29th of um, December. So you can see in the top right, uh, top left hand corner there, um, at 91.7, but NSEC uh, very high at 99.6, and that's fairly consistent. We're, we're often at NSEC above 98 percent in terms of capacity. Um, again, that, that drop evident, and we, we, we didn't 
interesting this year compared to last year. I think for me, we didn't achieve that degree of um, bed occupancy, the, the sort of the, the capacity. We were able to create that capacity last year, and we really felt that going into the into the new year. But this year, with was, was concerted effort from the teams, um, that we would manage to achieve that, which was, which was good. Um, and again, from a regional perspective, bed occupancy. So we're just sort of in the middle there, but you can see a lot of um, trusts are um, struggling there, particularly Gateshead. Uh, difficult um, few uh, weeks, days at the start of the month, um, and uh, North Tees, but again the greener area highlighting that period over, over Christmas where most areas were able to create some capacity. And then in terms of just the, in, so this is obviously a, you know, an in, in extremely busy time, um, but um, we also have to factor in two periods of industrial action. Um, so the first one between the 20th and the 22nd of December and then the subsequent one on the 30th of January. Um, I did my first night shift in, in about 11 years um, <laughs> and I can safely say that the ability to sleep during the day does not improve with age, nor does, <laughs> nor does the recovery period, but anyway, but we got through it. And again, again, testament to teams really, I mean, it's, you know, the, the you can see the, the uh, percentage options right there is sitting roughly around 75% consistently. I think the, the January period of industrial action was probably the hardest one I feel that we faced. I think it was, a, it was the first one we've really done in a sustained period of escalation and I think we did feel that, but again, you know, the teams have done extremely well to, you know, to cover the, the areas that we need to bring in to pull together. Um, so we're not sure what's what's coming up in terms of any potential um, future for just lecture. I'm going to hand over to Jeremy now. You are. Um, but the slides aren't the right ones for. So I think it's fair to say we went through the performance bit at. Yeah. in quite some detail, um, as you can imagine. So I know that it continues to be difficult for the, the teams currently, but I think that, and this is a bit that Jeremy will come on to, I think the bit that recognising the pressures that staff are feeling and also recognising that it's perhaps not the experience that we <coughs> want for our patients. We are constantly looking to make sure that despite that, the <coughs> services remain safe, and I think that is important to do both, I think from the patient point of view, but also from our own staff's point of view, because clearly they, what they want to do is try and ensure that the care that we deliver is as safe as possible. Right, so with apologies, because we've been um, looking at the mortality data, um, all the way through December, and I've got an updated report. I'm afraid the, uh, that presentation had the old slides on it. We're going to get the new ones. Which all look fairly similar, but I am highlighting that performance bit with the nadir, which is in peak, uh, in pink, sorry, which was around the 12th. Here we go. So, um, as part of this, we I've, I've done some summaries about the big and the small days right the way across uh, um, uh, the trust, and I'm going to probably uh, focus a little more around the performance at the Northumbria. And so, I'm looking at the figures not just for the whole trust, but how we perform against our four-hour target. And what I want to point out, if you, you look right at that bottom line, so that's between the number of people who attend and the number of people who, get, who, who, uh, who are seen, the, the performance uh, bottomed out uh, at 42% on, on the Northumbria side. And if you can see trust performance varied between 94 and 74% of its worst whereas the Northumbria performance at 92 and 42, with some very, very um, high peak attendances for us at the Northumbria, with 416, which I think is a record. So 
What I've looked is there is a pattern to the pressure. And the pattern is that we have our biggest attend days at the Northumbria um, on a Monday and a Tuesday um, with that 416 and then 413 was the largest Tuesday, but an average of 350 or um, 358, and that drops off um, across the week. Um, you can see that we're still admitting elective patients all the way through that time onto all of our sites, um, and approximately converting uh, but it varies between a Monday at 32% and our highest on a Friday where it's 37% of those attendances to admissions. Um, which might suggest that as the week goes on, that the, um, the acuity of the patients attending the Northumbria does also change across the week. Um, very high occupancies. Um, and then we can see the uh, overall performance average with that Saturday, it's a Saturday at 42% was our nadir. And that Friday, 53.4% was the Friday before the Saturday. These are all averaged over eight weeks. Um, and if you look, on that, on that uh, second week of December, where it was 42 and 53 percent, we had had a big admit week um, uh, with. Um, yeah. uh, we had it was a big, but we had a phenomenal Friday um, at 137. And I think part of the problem is, is that um, whilst you can look at averages of, of performance, it does come in clumps. And when, and when performance is really tough, it, that, that was a very, very difficult weekend for all concerned. So we've reviewed all of, uh, we reviewed, we have a medical sit, set of medical examiners, and there were 385 deaths um, during that eight week period. Um, and we uh, recorded the cause of death, we were able to sign the death certificate. 341 of them. 370 um, were considered by the medical examiners not to be preventable, and nine uh, there might have been some evidence of preventability. When we consider harm to have occurred um, is not until we get to uh, scores of three and four, so these are not very high numbers, and they're consistent with the sort of numbers we find all the way through the year. Um, during that period, 21 died within the emergency department or the es escalation ward, which is called SSA. Um, and uh, it, the medical examiners look in our incident reporting system, Datex, and they noted that 30 patients had a Datex recorded before the point of death, but m the majority of them were our most common um, incidents. They weren't related to the cause of death. They were. Um, pressure ulcers, falls, um, and medicines reconciliation issues. Um, there were 38 um, uh, reviews requested by the medical examiner, and in fact, the majority of those were, were requested in the first four week tranche when we had most, uh, most of the pressure. And there was no example of an impact from the busyness of the unit seen on outcome. There was one where there was a delayed um, ambulance transfer back to NSEG, which was felt to have an Im uh, impact upon care, um, but it didn't, in fact, impact upon the outcome. And I think that's a bit of a theme, uh, not the transfer one, but um, the, the, this does have an impact on care and the care that staff can give. These are our incident reports through the same period, um, and uh, they've gone up and down, and in fact, a little bit lower over Christmas. Um, uh, the second table is uh, incidents per occupied uh, bed days, and then there's a bit of a breakdown on severity. Um, and it is interesting, so those, uh, that little uh, in the middle graph where, where um, the patients died, uh, there were four deaths across the period between uh, the 5th of December and the 13th 
that were reported on VATES. Um, three of those were reported from within the emergency area. Um, uh, the medical examiners record the cause of death, and this is a very usual collection of those. No particular um, uh, respiratory viruses going along. I think that has been relatively kind to us. Um, uh, quite a quite a, a large number of pneumonia and cancer, including metastatic cancer, and pa patients with severe frailty and chronic conditions that uh, impact upon. Uh, their death, and I've analysed um, the demographics uh, and where patients died and when they died, and you can see um, that uh, most patients um, were um, over the age of uh, 85, and uh, most patients did, died on a ward, and quite a proportion of them died after a significant period of time being in an inpatient, um, dying on our base sites as well. We also grade for aspects of uh, care, whether it's good practice or whether there were things that were room for improvement. Um, and we found that uh, 352, there were no problems whatsoever uh, found. And there's a table there that shows how that triangulates with um, preventability. So um, when I look for a pattern across all of our sites, our main sites in the emergency department, looking to be relating that to when we are most at pressure, um, there isn't a pattern to be seen um, uh, and that uh, the deaths seem relatively evenly spread throughout the week, possi possibly coming um, towards the weekend when we are actually usually less pressurised. This is um, a, a graph that goes all the way back to December 19 um, with the uh, red line the um, rate of deaths per admission and the blue is the actual number of deaths and you can see that there's been no um, unusual peak this year um, nor has there been um, a higher than normal um, uh, pattern of deaths within ED, although this data comes from PAS, so um, only includes November, which was part of the study period. Absolutely lots to learn, but the similar patterns to previous years, albeit that December 22 was quite an, ex uh, an exception. Um, the safety reflection is still going on. We will have the, the final deep dive at February Safety and Quality Committee, which allows for all the more in-depth reviews to be reported on, um, for us to receive staff and patient feedback, including the redeployment pilot that's going on in our lodge patient ward in ED. Um, we will need to look again at the late January pressures because we've had another period of uh, activity and will uh, publish that in due course and we need to think about how this impacts on us accelerating some of the system changes in our clinical strategy, um, primary care streaming, ambulatory care capacity and opening hours, out of hospital capacity and perhaps some urgent outpatients to give people alternatives to the Northumbria. But overall Clinically, the business we've seen is business as usual. No unexpected outcomes or care processes so far beyond what we'd expect to normally see. Um, but in the context of extreme pressure, being able to maintain business as usual is really commendable. And it's, it's, it's done at quite a significant cost to the extraordinary efforts and ability of our teams, and we need to be clear that we're very grateful because it's a difficult um, uh, time for them to operate when they are having uh, patients who are in corridors on wards and ED is, is as full as it has been. We have certainly seen some examples of poor experience, some as a result of the volume of patients and the flow and bed availability. It's resulted in corridor care or wait for beds 
And we need to recognise the impact that has on patients, their loved ones, and on the staff needing to deliver care in less than ideal circumstances. Um, because it's the staff that mitigate um, for those pressured by making sure that they attend to all of the things that they need to. Sorry for the problems with the slides, but we got there in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> comprehensive report. Always helpful if we have the chance to see them beforehand, but um, this is a good presentation. I was, I was doing them on Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions, comments? Ben? Just to make a comment from someone that's previously been quite involved in the thick of it, I guess, and not so much anymore. I think just whilst being on call and, and helping around the planning and things, I think it's just really clear around the teamwork, the flexibility of staff, and I know how tired teams are, um, but it, their approach and um, flexibility and teamwork across getting what needs to be done, done, um, it's, still really, it's obviously really nice to see. Steve? I feel like I've been poking around at weekend discharges, um, not very successfully so far, but I, I just wonder, I mean, two things, one is, uh, presumably, we get discharges are so few because of adult social care um, capabilities, and that's not going to get any easier um, with with local authority financing. But I just the question really is: Are we sure we're doing everything we can within our own power to uh, maximise the amount of people who leave at the weekend? Um, I've heard of uh, models such as nurse-led discharge, things like that, which can sometimes get people out, especially given one day we know we can predict it's going to be the busy day. So what can we do to clear out on Saturday and Sunday? Thank you. So yeah. can I just... So, so at the Northumbria, actually, discharges don't drop a great deal at the weekends. But at the base sites, undoubtedly, they do. Um, and I think that is for the reason that Steve suggests. So I think we, we do really try to pay as much attention to the things that we can control. But generally, if you are on a base site and can go home to your own home, that's to say there are no uh, people, we, we do have systems um, that allow patients to do that. Um, but I don't know if Paul's got anything more to say. That's. <coughs> It's not to say that we, we, we wouldn't want to increase it, Steve, because we definitely no, would. We do, and every, every Friday we have a list of conditional discharges, which um, we work through, and we're trying to work on how we increase that number. It is, like you said, it's picking out the easier discharges mm -hmm. on the weekend, because you don't have the support services around you. Sometimes beds will be identified in care homes that we could go on Friday, but we can go on the Saturday. Um, but it's definitely something on our radar to work on and try and improve, because you alluded to it there, you've got slow discharges out of one place and other areas from there. So we are working on what we can do with the consultant teams, with the nurse teams, as well around being trying to increase that number. Marion, she's Simon and visual separate. Yeah, so I think as well we can improve our discharges that we can, but I think that for the the case. Particularly, thanks. I still think there's room for improvement uh, for discharges at the weekend, particularly nurse led ones and just looking at our risk appetite. But, Paul, I know that you and the team are working closely with Terry on the community side of things just to see if there is that risk appetite and that some of the community staff can visit these patients at home as a short term thing. I think it's really helpful to hear more about that in due course. So, maybe there is a bit of work going on looking at those patients discharged on a Monday. And actually, just looking at all those patients to base that, and then actually, what's what could have, could they have gone home on the weekend? You know, what what are the what are the reasons? Is it what's in our control? What's in our control? So just to try and look at some of that. So that'd be quite interesting. Isn't it? I think that's the key bit um, is to look because what we don't see on a Monday is a big empty out because there is a balance between who could actually go over a weekend because actually if there was all of these people that could have gone on a weekend and whatever services we're not, we'd expect to see quite a large discharge rate on a Monday, which we don't see. So I think there's a benefit, absolute benefit in seeing who does go on a Monday and could we have brought that forward if X other support services were there. Got Marcus and Joe. <laughs> comments from everyone so far. I think 
is, has been a really difficult period over the last six weeks, um, but only for the staff, so I'm going to what Beth was saying there as well. I think the other element to this, which we are looking at, is the bed base um, from a medicine perspective, and how does that need to look moving forward um, to support flows? Going back to Simon's points, we do know that we'll, we'll get flow right. It's not necessarily just about having more beds, it's the whole system approach or discharge, as many variables in it. We'll have to get that right flatten the curve to try and sustain the performance we want to, but also alleviate the pressures on the staff teams as well. So I think the two are absolutely within the key. Yeah, it was just a small comment, just to loop back to my presentation at the beginning around where we see the, the sort of deterioration somewhat in patient experience that's very much on bed weight. Um, and generally spine up on his side. Just that that brought us back around and from the Maybe. Just one final thing, just about the balance, just about the balance of um, discharging over the weekend to make sure that not readmitted on the Monday or the Tuesday of the following week, mm -hmm. and that is a, a, a fine balance. Yes, so I, I think one of the things that has been different about this year is the use of the virtual ward, and I think that has helped us to discharge um, patients and take more risk and I, I, I see that as something that we probably haven't yet fully utilised. We've had fantastic flip to that flexibility Beth was talking about doesn't just apply to our inpatient locations. There's a lot of staff in the community who are all part of this effort but I think that is just something that could grow through this year and we'll need to carefully review um, because it has been a funded pilot until this time next year. Yeah, and what's the process of reviewing that? I'm really interested to see what comes out of that. I've seen a couple of <coughs> strange and not very well documented reports on HFJ suggesting that virtual wards are twice the cost of, of uh, uh, in, in ward, which I do, do not believe. Um, but at some point we're going to just need to have a proper look at all this. Is it scheduled? Or? I think the ICB are looking to do something more regionally across the patch, which will come with its own problems because I think yeah. we've all implemented virtual ward in a slightly different way. And in some areas, there's a balance between virtual ward and, I'm going to say, hospital at home. So the, the term gets used interchangeably, and we know that they are two different things. I think increasingly, from our own perspective, from a risk register, we've sometimes got 100 patients on our virtual ward. If they were inpatients, we would absolutely be in a real mess. And, and if the funding is potentially at risk, we need to think what is the alternative because it's a real strategic risk for us. Because genuinely, I think most of us here would think that those patients would have been in the hospital bed. There may well be a cost. I don't think the cost would be twice as, even if they're equivalent, that's still 100 beds that we haven't got as an inpatient. Facility, so we definitely need to have a real root and branch look at this. Okay, well, I'd really like us to see that. Um, and if ICB takes too long, <coughs> can we think about what we can do ourselves? Because I'm also conscious that as uh, as a clinical strategy rolls through, it's our opportunity to look again. I'm, I'm still constantly looking at this data to see what, what's the age spread of patients being admitted. Is there something in very simple terms about the type of conditions and bring them in that would help me and uh, help us think through alternative strategies that might reduce the pressure and reduce the flow? And then there's all the other end stuff. Where do most people go? What's the split between destinations? Where are, where are the perceived barriers? And you know that kind of wider flow discussion. I think we haven't. We may have had it before my time, but in my time we haven't had that flow discussion in in board, in board development or elsewhere. Chair, I'm, I'm not giving you up-to-date data, but I'm very confident in saying um, from previous years that in terms of mean, our mean admission age is, is a slightly over 83. Yeah, okay. But just a little bit more on that would still be helpful and more differentiation of the people for me, but we could hold that. Um, anything more really helpful update? I think that key message of Thanks to colleagues for the flexibility they've been showing over this week. <coughs> must be the top message that we uh, take from this. Uh, but there's more analysis to be done. Uh, it's already underway, and we will be coming back to this to how we can be improving the flow uh, and improving the patient experience in future meetings. Good to go. Then, um, uh, Beth, uh, we're on with child health.
I'm the time pressure. Yes. I'm afraid we are under time pressure. Can you speak quickly? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. In the brief version. Uh, thanks very much for asking us to present for Child Health. So I'm Johnny Cardwell, I'm a community pediatrician and the business unit director for Child Health. Um, so it will be brief because uh, I present this slide uh, each time. It's just to reflect really the different services that we have in child health across community, uh, paediatric inpatients and mental health services. So although it's a small business unit with uh, about 323 uh, staff, um, we have contact with thousands of children and families uh, each month because of the breadth of services that we provide. There's four slides which just talk about the year uh, in, uh, in review. So uh, towards the end of last year, towards the end of 2022, there was lots of worries about uh, group A strep infection in children and uh, that caused lots of anxiety and we were very busy on the paediatric unit. Uh, primary care was busy, urgent care was busy as well. And that sort of ended uh, early on in January really and since then we followed the usual pattern uh, of uh, peaks and troughs in busyness usually to do with infection in children on the unit, um, whatever uh, bug is going around. Um, but just generally the numbers continue to uh, increase so uh, it's busy on the paediatric unit. There's a couple of slides later on that show the figures uh, but we've been uh, maintained uh, ED performance uh, and patient satisfaction on the unit as well. Uh, we weren't as affected by the junior doctors and consultants drive. We're fortunate to have lots of um, a good workforce in terms of advanced paediatric nurse practitioners on the unit and upstairs on special care. Um, a couple of years ago, we developed a paediatric uh, room on the unit for children with autism and learning disability, which uh, had appropriate sensory support for them. It was something that, um, from feedback that we've got from families about that. And this year, we've opened uh, a room for uh, families who have been bereavement in their families uh, and children, young people who are having mental health assessments uh, as well, sort of out of the busyness of the, of the unit itself. Um, Clinical noting was introduced this year that seemed to go quite well, so we're in line with the rest of the trust now in paediatric. Uh, one of the things just about paediatrics generally you know, over the last um, eight, probably a bit longer really, uh, years, there's been reconfiguration and reorganisation of paediatric inpatients across the whole of uh, the North East and in many places. Um, Newcastle provides secondary care paediatrics and specialist paediatrics and it's just apparent there's not enough inpatient beds for general paediatrics uh, in Newcastle and probably regionally there is a reduction in inpatient paediatric beds uh, and we uh, noticed that because we're asked to keep children longer than we would be normally uh, commissioned for for keeping children and so there's work going on regionally and with uh, with Newcastle involvement as well, looking at inpatient paediatric provision and what we may need to do if we want to uh, vary the model that we've got in terms of staffing and the commissioning of that and the estate as well. Uh, we've started some sedation MRIs for uh, babies from four months up to about seven years, which will reduce referrals to Newcastle. Um, a couple of national audits that we were part of, so we provide a paediatric epilepsy service and we were a positive outlier for access to paediatric epilepsy nursing. There's a bit more work to do around epilepsy, improving waiting times to be seen in a first seizure clinic uh, and quite a bit of work around the mental health support for children with epilepsy. There's an increased representation of mental health problems in children with epilepsy. Child protection standard audit again. We provide a child protection assessment service uh, in community paediatrics and national audit, and uh, we were uh, did very well in terms of meeting the standards of good practice uh, in the first SR for that nationally. Uh, felt comfortably within that. Uh, what to pick out, really. Uh, we've been seeing really improvements in the waiting times for children uh, going through this. CAM service in North Tyneside for neurodevelopmental assessment, so that's for conditions autism, <laughs> ADHD. We've had uh, support, quite a lot of support through the trust with Helios, a, a private organisation that's been helping with that. It's coming to an end, so there'll be work to do about how we continue that good progress that we've made. Why is it coming to an end? 
it's the end of the uh, sort of contracts with that, you know. So that's there's discussion about that. Um, and uh, the school based immunisation service. So we took on the contract to provide school based immunisations in Gateshead. And uh, that started in September and it's gone really well. The staff has settled in well into the team. We're using electronic consents now, which has been really beneficial for that. And um, in terms of uh, a couple of other things, children in care. So we provide a, a service, a health service for children in care in terms of initial assessments for those children. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of children placed in care over the last uh, 12 months. And that doesn't look like that's reducing. Uh, Kylo House is a secure accommodation for young people in Northumberland. We provide health services into that, and that maintains its uh, CQC rating uh, of outstanding uh, in a recent uh, review. In terms of patient experience, there's a couple of slides that show patient experience uh, information from CAMS, Primary Mental Health Worker Service. Uh, and this next one is for the acute paediatric unit. And they're all generally really positive. We get very good uh, patient experience. I think one of the things that we want to do this year is, um, it's in the annual plan around uh, collating our patient experience across the business units in a, in a better, more accessible way. But also I think uh, getting young people and families involved more in some of the service developments. Uh, we do that uh, to some extent, but not lot more widely and I think we've done it more successfully in the past um, so that's something that we want to work on this year. A couple of slides about paediatric uh, business up at Cramlington, so the darker blue line is this year, that big peak in December last year, it wasn't far off 3,000 patients in a month, so sort of, you know, around 100 a day on average, we have some days which are 130 in December last year with the strep, uh, streptococcal issue. Um, but it varies between 50 to 67, 68 patients a day on average on the unit, which is considerably more than we thought it would have been when we opened them. And it's just, this is just a reflection of, uh, we did quite a lot of work over the beginning part of the year. We had um, quite a lot of children waiting for outpatient appointments and some children who hadn't completed the assessment, certainly in the allergy service, with recruitment that we've had in the team, we brought down the weights for outpatients quite significantly and completed the uh, assessments, the allergy assessments as well, well within the 18 week time. Um, in terms of the staff in the team, we had quite a lot of uh, successful recruitment um, to consultant level and acute paediatric community in Cairns that we just appointed uh, on Friday uh, and to a new post in paediatric emergency medicine. So in, uh, we're successful in recruitment. I think people do feel it's a good place to come and work. Um, and we've also been successful in increasing to the primary mental health worker posts in Northumberland. They've previously been quite difficult to recruit, recruit to and to retain, but uh, we've been successful with that. Uh, there's going to be some work, well, it's already started, but carrying on uh, over the, uh, this time of year and spring around looking in uh, the special care baby units. Uh, Team working there and support uh, support with colleagues from the uh, staff experience team. We had really helpful involvement from staff experience with our camp service a few years ago, and I'm not sure it will be the same this time. This is more on staff experience. This is this year, so I'm going to quickly continue. I hope we change the presentation. Um, but generally, the business unit score quite highly for staff experience, and we compare that to the trust. Um, so generally do well across all domains. Uh, again, this is the emotional well-being uh, resilience uh, domain. So I think child health, it's, uh, it's been busy. It's a business unit that covers uh, lots of different services across community, acute mental health services. You have lots of children and families uh, every month. Um, I think we're well supported by the executive team and by trust board. I feel that the voice of children is heard in the organisation. Um, there are continued pressures, um, particularly around mental health and around business on the acute unit generally. I think those are the two bigger pressure areas for us at the minute. Um, 
uh, confident fundals, uh, fundamentals of the business year in Australia. Any questions? That's Johnny, really, really encouraging and positive and upbeat report. Questions or comments? Um, yes, I guess, thanks, Johnny. Very important and fantastic to see. Uh, I guess the, the worry here is the, um, the ability to sustain the 23 hour model yeah. and the pressure on uh, the Baker Children's Hospital. We've been worrying about this certainly all the time I've been on the board, and I just sense that the regional efforts are admiring the problem rather than fixing it, or am I just reading it wrongly there? I'm really sorry to you about catch that last bit uh, that you said. Really you the, uh, part, of that, part of the question. So you mentioned that it was being looked at regionally. Mm. Uh, I just worry sometimes if the regional examination of it is admiring the problem rather than fixing it, which we would probably be doing. Yeah, there was. Um, I think it's just finally available for a more general review. A paper that was uh, sent out towards the middle of last week, looking at. Um, from the uh, organisational delivery network for surgery and critical care, looking at the activity in all the uh, acute units and activity across the region generally. And there were some recommend whether those recommendations won't be taken on and to what level there will be. There were some recommendations within that to address some of the inpatient capacity <coughs> issues. So um, I think um, you know it'd be. A, is that significant change from the model that we all have in district general ball and inpatient pediatric <coughs> units and then it was recognised like the same children was reduced in and it's usually uh, by far less than 24 hours and there was a reconfiguration of those units but I think the inpatient provision uh, is probably too low across the region um, overall. Um, just what I was going to um, a separate point as well, but from an inpatient point of view, obviously we are actively looking and talking to Newcastle about what we can do as well as part, it is kind of part of the regional work, but also separately to move some of those discussions forward to say this is what we can offer. Um, so that's some of the work that obviously we're doing as part of that. Um, my other point was also, it was just going to be around, um, I know it was, you attended the celebration event that we had and I think we picked out a few things to include on the taking stock for the year but actually there could have been far more and it was just a really positive event to see what the teams across child health and the improvements that they've made over the year and it was just lovely to see that um, as part of that we could have included far more I think on the on, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Um, really uplifting presentation, but you have identified that there is a recognised pressure, particularly with children and young people's mental health. And I just wanted a little bit more detail on what that actually means mm -hmm. and what is our partnership relationship with CNTW. Mm -hmm. And is that helping or is that hindering? Mm -hmm. um, so, absolutely, significant increase in children and young people being the support around their mental health. Uh, emotional health and I think it's just increasing recognition all the time that children and young people um, have got issues and uh, an expectation that we'll be able to provide services for that. So there's lots of I think investment within schools, the support within schools and another sort of online or uh, other services that young people can access and sometimes prefer to access rather than sitting down and speaking to someone. Um, but it is an increase, uh, there is a significant increased pressure in that. Um, so in terms of the level of where that fits with what level of support those children and young people need, a lot of it is probably at that tier one, tier two level. And I think within Northumberland, uh, there's been a big increase in the primary mental health worker workforce, which uh, addresses a lot of that and works with the schools in particular. In North Tyneside, that we provide the tier three service and, and we have work with the uh, with education and social care largely uh, about what else might be able to be provided at those other uh, tier one tier two levels to support uh, young people and this work was definitely gone on around that um our relationship with tier four which is cntw um 
I think from a clinical perspective, discussing with the clinicians, taking experts advice, that works really well. It's a relatively small service and people know each other. But you get that difficulty sometimes in inpatient bed provision in tier four services for things like eating disorders or uh, young people that need to be admitted and that being a national issue, not just an issue for CNTW. Um, but I, I think uh, generally the relationships are there, but it's, um, it's a complicated business at that end. Uh, it's not just young people with a mental health problem, there's an educational component, there's a social care component, there's a family aspect to it, so it's multi-agency working for those very complex people, young people, at that end of the pathway. I'm really conscious of time, I've got two more. Be sure and Steve. No, it's just very quick, it's just on Richard's point and to reiterate what Ben said. So it's a keen work stream of the alliance, is paediatrics and the paediatric model in particular between ourselves, Newcastle and Gates, as we all kind of interconnected. So Ben said the ICB looking at it, it's one of the other ways that the alliance and connects can move quite quickly. Yeah, that's an important we as a board will have a chance to look at the game as part of the reporting to board processes. Um, Steve, and then I'm wrapping up. Two hopefully straightforward ones. The patient survey, parent or child or both. Steve, I can't hear you, it's not on. Who answers the uh, patient survey? Is that the, the, the parent, the child or both? Is it yeah, it, it, well, it depends on the age really, so um, usually from 11, 12, the young person you'd hope that they would fill it in, whether they always do, or whether mm. they get a bit of help, I don't know. Thank you, but, and um, what have we learned from the Helios relationship, Is the, apart from more boots on the ground, yeah. what practically have we learned that we could take further? Yeah, I mean the Helios, it worked remotely, it was, um, it's an online based uh, assessment, so there's lots of information gathering when you're looking at children who might have an autism or an ADHD diagnosis. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that which is collected beforehand and then there's online uh, conversations, assessments with the young person and with the family. Um, so I think we wondered how much that would want to be taken up, whether people still want to come in and see some more, or whether actually, um, I think, Lots of young people are very comfortable doing that sort of assessment online. Uh, so I think there was, uh, if you get the procedures, the, the process right around gathering information, making um, uh, sort of formula, formulations based on evidence from the information you received, it can be quite streamlined from that point of view. So I think we'll, uh, we've learned lots from it. I think the team have probably found that it's actually um, been better received than they thought it would and it's been more efficient than they thought it would have been uh, and children have kept and families have kept through the process rather than dropping out of the scum board. Okay, thank you. A really positive, really upbeat report. Thanks to the unit, to you Johnny and Beth, but uh, more generally to the unit for the progress they've made. Uh, we, we are still not free of anxiety about the mental health services. No. I've kind of always felt that a 48 week waiting list is not a waiting list. It's, it's, uh, it's a kind of nothing. Um, so I kind of, I'll be happier when we're making much more uh, progress there and we will be hearing more about the possibilities arising out of, of uh, rearrangement of some of the pediatric mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, moving on, Beth, the we'll challenge for you now uh, because it's now 25 to 2. Um, I'm intending to close this meeting in 10 minutes. Um, uh, but in some ways it's easier because this paper on Fuller uh, is suggesting that we are meeting all the requirements. Uh, so you probably don't need to take us through the detail. Um, uh, what uh, Any bits, highlights you need to bring before we check that the board is content and reassured that we're taking the actions we need. Um, no, that was absolutely what I was going to say. I think we're, we're saying that we're fully compliant with the updated HTAB standards. Um, we do an annual audit. We've actually got an inspection from the HTA on the 14th of February, which we've collected and um, submitted all our evidence for, and we don't have any concerns regarding the HTA B um, standards as part of that evidence collection. That's great. Um, are anybody got any questions or challenges, or are you happy to receive this uh, uh, in assuring report? Okay. Thank you. Well done. Well done all. Um, then we're on Education Quality Improvement Plan, Jeremy. 
Yeah, so, sorry, I've got the chair. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on behalf of Andrew for, for that. Good, we're being asked to approve the suite of documents to be submitted to HEE and to support, continue to support the education governance structure and to support the ongoing processes to ensure the accountability of business. I mean, we, get, we always get excellent feedback uh, reports generally and um, the education team have all of the detailed um, response to the feedback that we get in, in hand. Any questions or comments? It's a comprehensive set of, of reports. Had the chance to go through them. There's hardly any concerns of any significance. Some significant successes as well. I think we're ready to approve the suite of papers and the government's processes outlined in the paper. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we move on now? Ross has got a couple of papers, CPC regulation, stakeholder engagement. And again, Chair, that I'll, yep. in the interest of time, I'll be really brief. Uh, I think Jules outlined probably a lot of the deal of her um, presentations earlier on. Um, usual compliance period <coughs> and, and probably all the standards. One thing I would draw your eye to was I've talked a little bit in the last few weeks about um, face-to-face engagement post-pandemic and I think the team's uh, really got into the rhythm of that now. So a good range of um, systems and channels for that engagement. So I think we're, we're fully compliant there. Um, second paper really is just for information, the next set of dates of the government elections. They'll be subject to a national election being called in the summer. So if that does happen, we'll have to think again. But, um, that's that's things start now. Just for Good. So first of all, on the stakeholder engagement, really pleased to see that we're getting back into our swing. There was a good event with the voluntary sector at the end of last week. I had the privilege of attending that. Was good. Um, any questions or comments? First of all, on that, on that CPC governance. Secondly, on the process for elections for governors. Can I just draw attention? But I think our experience has been where people are kind of nobbled, where you identify someone who could be an effective independent governor and bringing their own fresh view, um, uh, they're more likely to come through the system, otherwise it feels a bit remote. So I know a couple of you have been talking with friends and neighbours or whatever to encourage them to um, put their name forward and, and I would encourage that please. Anything more on that? Now that's the governance section. Then we've got items for escalation from the board committee. We've got um, Marion, the nursing and midwifery. I just see one thing, and I said that you'll get the paper. It's a good news story, I think, and you know that we've been doing a huge amount of work um, regarding staff movement, and it's one of the biggest things that people um, are very unhappy about. And I would just like to highlight that last December we had 807 staff moves. This December we've got 424. Really uh, I think it's really good and well done to everybody for really taking that on board. And I think it does help the staff experience, but I also think it contributes to our slight improvement with um, sickness access. Yeah, that's a, that's a real sign of progress. I always worry when the report says, as it does every month, we are unable to meet all staffing requests for patient falls dependency levels. Do we have any evidence of kind of a direct link between not meeting those staffing levels and increasing falls? No, because we monitor it very closely. Um, each area is looked at independently and uh, there isn't anything from a safety angle, but we just need to see that uh, we can't monitor every single area, because that is the truth. Okay, as usual, this is comprehensive reporting. Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Just a query, Murray. Yeah. It's a great report, but where is EHP reported? Yes, yeah, so that is work that we're just doing at the moment, and it's a very good point, Margaret. Um, we concentrated on doing some of the community work first, and the EHP report is coming, and it, we're just about there with it being working with IT, etc. Very good. Well spotted. Good spot. Okay. Pleased to have received that. Then we're into um, Chris, uh, Corporate Safety and Quality. Yeah. Just we've kind of with, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, just just another three points we pulled out and, and put chair around ED for our performance and the ambulance handover delays in ED, the 52 rate position and um, 
comes back backlogs over 62 days has been the three kind of, uh, key areas of concern. Yeah, we had a proper chew over it at FIP. Is there anything, Phil, you would want to highlight for the board? Uh, probably just worth mentioning that we've raised the risk categorisation of this to the very high um, and we're looking for appropriate documentation around the plans, etc., to address the point. That's the only other point to make. Yeah, good. With that noting, then we go on to Paul's Corporate Financial Compliance. Yes, Chair, just to confirm on target. Again, and once again, we had the chance to go into it thoroughly um, within FIT. Then we're into those kind of sweep up bits. The um, agenda for the next meeting. I never really know how to do this. Um, the moment it's listed Monday, uh, it'll shift probably to Wednesday or Thursday, so that it's no longer fo immediately following uh, FIT. I'm sure we'll have updated the agenda by the time we get there. Anything people want to add? How's the meeting gone? It's over run by 15 minutes. I apologise for that. You've only got 15 minutes for your lunch. Any other feedback apart from moaning about the timekeeping? <laughs> All okay. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. For those of you in the private board, we'll see you in 15 minutes.